Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 167. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I am your host, Jay Massey, and I am excited for what you are going to hear and learn today. Now, many of you, if you've seen me in person or if you've known me for any length of time, you know that I can often be distracted. I get see opportunity everywhere we go. I mean, once your mind has been trained to recognize opportunity, it's kind of hard to pass it by. And well, today's guest calls himself the ADD entrepreneur. And I can completely understand because every time he sees an opportunity, he seems to take advantage of it himself. Most importantly, he's also known as a billion dollar real estate agent. Now that's billion with a B. Many of you have heard of many million dollar real estate agents. Today, we're talking with billion dollar real estate agents, New York Times international best-selling author, and a host of a brand new real estate podcast where our guest actually interviews real estate rock stars. I'll give you one guess who's been a guest on his show, but I think you already know. With that being said, though, the thing that I'm the most impressed about is that many of us have talked to many different agents. We've dealt with realtors on all different levels. Here's one of the realtors actually owns the product that he sells. Help me welcome Mr. Pat Hyben. Pat, you there? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jay. Well, first, I just want to thank you for actually owning the product you sell. There's so many realtors that we run into that, well, don't. Yeah, false profits, right? And some of them even rent. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's just very, very frustrating sometimes. It's like, yeah, I specialize in investment. Do you own any? No. Well, you're not too special then. Not too special. Now, one of the things that I want to do is I often ask everybody the same question. I look at today's entrepreneurs, and you are clearly that, uh, like yesterday's superheroes, you know, know, Batman, Robin, Superman, you know, the Flash, whatever floats your boat. The point is, I look at today's entrepreneurs alike like that because yesterday's superheroes, you know, they get dressed up and they save people using their special skills and talents and occasional tool belts uh, to go out there and save people from their own mistakes and self in some way, shape, or form, improving the lives of other people. I think entrepreneurs do the exact same thing. However, just like superheroes, before they were super, they were just, you know, people. They had an origin story. They started somewhere, somehow, one day, and then boom, you know, they appeared on the scene. What I'd love to know is before you called yourself the ADD entrepreneur or the billion-dollar real estate agent, who is Pat Hyben? Yeah, that's that. That's a cool question. I mean, I, I would say I <clears throat> I was lost. I mean, a lot of people say to me, hey, you know, why did you get into real estate? Because essentially, a little bit of my story, Jay, is, um, you know, I started out as a real estate agent – And then I built a real estate team, uh, became a real estate broker, became a real estate investor, uh, and then became an investor in small companies. And currently, I I own 14 different companies and about, you know, 30 some other lines of what I call horizontal income, which is instead of having one thing, like one job where you get 5% raise every year, that would be a vertical income source. I have horizontal sources. I have currently have 48 horizontal sources. So, so how did I start out from being a real estate agent to someone with 48 lines of horizontal income? I would say, um, not by design. Uh, certainly (laughs) I, you know, I, I, I got out of college. I had a degree in sociology. I got a 2.6 
from a small college, nice. local, uh, yeah, local uh, Frostburg State College in Western Maryland, and um, I was going to be a probation officer, and then they kind of told me, you know, we're not hiring right now. You got to wait about a year and a half to be a probation officer. And so I tried to to get a couple of sales jobs. They all thought that I looked too young, um, that I didn't have, you know, my competition was too fierce, you know, with a sociology degree from a small college and a 2.6 GPA. I just couldn't get a job. I went into what had the least barrier to entry, which was get a real estate license and and (laughs) – You only get paid if you sell something, and uh, and that's how I ended up there. To be honest with you, it was not any great uh, conscious effort by any means. Well, the <laughs> I think it's funny you said least barrier to entry. It, it it's almost like well, I can do this. They're not going to say no here. So <laughs> yeah, let me, right. Let yeah. me do that. I, I think that's absolutely amazing. I mean, and that's oftentimes what I've heard a lot of people is like very few people. I know for myself, I didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I can't wait to be a real estate investor. That's right. not, <laughs> that was not the path. I thought it was going to be something completely different. Uh, but probation officer probably is one of the most unique things uh, that I have heard thus far. So you, but you've managed to do something that I find intriguing. You you keep reinventing yourself or making these transitions. I know for myself, I literally just a few weeks ago uh, bought my first uh, uh, chocolate company. So, and now I'm looking at a tech nice. company. So uh, as right. well. So it's like I and I'm beginning to make these transitions to other places, you know, in terms of where the income comes from as well. But you made a transition that. I think far too uh, few make uh, is that you manage to get out of the commission mindset uh, just as a real estate uh, you know agent and you you cross yes. that line over to investor. I would love for you to tell us uh, how you manage that thought uh, you know that transition. Yeah, well let me answer it exactly. I don't think that I could have become a, an investor in small companies successfully if I didn't have the investments in real estate first, because what the investments in real estate allowed me to do was quit my job as a real estate agent. And, you know, if I was still, you know, I saved money as a real estate agent better than most. Right. And then I took that money and I invested it in real estate. And then, and, and then when that, those horizontal lines started paying me enough to pay my bills, I started saying to myself, there was almost like this pause where I was like, you know, what would be fun to do? It was no longer about, you know, I got to do this because I need to pay my bills. You know, I got to sell this house. I got to do this. Instead, it became what would be fun. And and, and I didn't know how to answer that. And what happened was uh, people started coming to me and saying, hey, you know, I want to start my own business, but I don't have any money. Um, but here's what I have. I have a black book of business that, for instance, my first business that I got into outside of real estate was a, a payroll company. And a friend of mine uh, had a black book of clients that he'd been selling pay, payroll to for a, a large payroll company for about 15 years. And he says, look, Pat, I, I got 15 years of contacts, um, but I got three little kids and a wife and and I don't, uh, you know, I don't have money to start this business. So I said, here, well, how about I bankroll your business and and I believe in you and you go get it. And here it is today, fast forward, and he's in 48 different states. He's he's doing close to 10,000 paychecks for different companies um, every month wow. um, or every two-week pay period. Um, and it's very, very successful. And uh, I kind of hit the jackpot with that. And then after that, I started saying, well, well, okay, so now I'm getting money from that, right? I mean, and um, getting a passive income, a horizontal income from that. You know, what else is out there? And other people started coming to me, and I said, well, you know, you're you, you're a hard worker. I know you, uh, you know, almost all of these. Until recently, I only invested with people that I knew. And then in the last couple of years now, um, I invested in some things with some people that I don't know. Um, and the jury's not out whether they're going to work. Uh, as well as the other ones, but we'll see, you know? Right, right, right. Well, 
I, I think that's awesome, and I, I hope everybody hears. You know that ten thousand paycheck. You you're you're you could say that you paid played a very integral role in making. Uh, I'm going to say ten thousand jobs. You know by making those particular you know choices uh, you enabled an entrepreneur to go out there to do that very work that he or she is designed to do that's what we do is we create opportunity and you just you stepped into a completely different role and made that happen and i think that's amazing um hopefully we can create some more of those people as they're listening now the other thing that i think is important for many people to say and it's or here is the foundation of how real estate played a role in terms of giving you what you needed to be able to go out there and to do other things. Um, I'm curious, other than just the, you know, income from real estate, did the experience of real estate play uh, make it easier for you to make those transitions? Or was it just purely the fact that you had the passive income coming in? Um, you know, I think the uh, from a numerical standpoint, from a looking at numbers standpoint, and analyzing a property and its rent to to price ratio, and it's you know, you know how much money is this going to bring in? How much money is this going to cost? Um, and, and then a tracking of you know, well, this one brings in five hundred a month. This one brings in three grand a month. Um, and looking at reports and expense reports and things like that certainly led up to being able to read a profit loss statement of a, of a company, a balance sheet of a company, things like that. So I would say yes. Got it. Got it. That, well, and that's one of the things that I like about real estate is I, I feel less though by doing something that has an easy proof of concept, real estate, you can then expand and take that experience to something that has a more difficult proof of concept, i.e. nearly any other business on the planet uh, is is in that category. And it gives you a, a very good foundation uh, in order to build passive income or cash flow, or as you like to say, lines of horizontal income. Uh, that's definitely something that you know I appreciate a lot. Speaking of the horizontal income, why don't you explain... Uh, if you will, a little bit, because I, I know you and I have talked about it before, but explain to those who may not have heard the term or how that applies, especially because they, they may have a different understanding, uh, especially if they do apartment buildings or commercial real estate, what you mean by a horizontal line of income. Okay. So for instance, the easiest way to look at this is my first horizontal line of income was a house that I bought and I rented out. So if I have a mortgage payment on a house of $1,000 and the rent is $2,000, then I'm making $1,000 profit. That $1,000 is a horizontal line of income, meaning I'm going to get paid that $1,000 every month in my mailbox or in my bank account without me doing any work. So rather than just one house that's doing that, I have 48. Now, some of them are and an apartment building. I have seven apartment buildings. Um, so those could be big, could be not so big, depending on how well they're doing. Don't let that don't let that fool you that just because you say <laughs> I have an apartment building, I'm going to be making, you know, ten thousand uh, dollars or a hundred thousand dollars a month on that. That's not true. Some of them uh, don't pay anything. Some of them pay me, you know, a couple thousand dollars uh, or more a month. But the point being that that the ones that pay me are horizontal lines, um, all stacked in a row. And if I have, um, let's say, five thousand a month coming from Infinity HR, my payroll company, and I have five thousand a month coming from some Section Eight rentals I have in Baltimore City, and then I have another five thousand a month coming from some um, college apartments at University of Maryland College Park. And then if I have, uh, let's say, 500 coming from my book sales, six steps to seven figures, and then I have, say, 400 coming from, um, you know, our Ricky Williams licensing company, and then another, you know, um, 400 a month coming from uh, Green New It, Green Energy Company, you know, all these stacked are just uh, stacks of horizontal uh things that pay me money every month. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. I'm just curious as to why it's called why you call it horizontal. Is this because you can earn the income while laying down? No, it's a <laughs> um 
it grows horizontally. So the way I make it grow is I just add on these horizontal lines on top of each other. You got to imagine like um, a, a piece of line paper, right, right? right? And every every house that you buy is a new line. Right. So you're growing it. You know, these are horizontal lines. If you have a vertical line, it's like you only have one line. And every year it goes up 5% because you get a 5% raise on a horizontal line. I'm not necessarily expecting that house to pay me any more. Um, I'm expecting me to add another one and another one and another one. So I grow it horizontally. I started out with one and now I have 48. Yeah, uh, totally understood. Totally understood. Although I like my definition better. because <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. So, yeah. I answer your question, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Now, um, you... You just right there proved um, why you call yourself the ADD entrepreneur, which is great. And I think many people uh, can can gather that, you know, diversification is definitely something that's important. But talk to us a little bit about how you get that first one done. I get that question all the time. You know, I'm especially as an investor, sometimes, occasionally, I tend to work with, you know, realtors. How do I, as that investor, A, get that first deal done, but more importantly, especially when we move over to the commercial arena, uh, when I'm out there, how do I get that relationship and, and, and make sure that we have the best possible relationship between the investor and the realtor or realtors occasionally that are involved to make everything work? So is the question, how do you get the first a private company done or how to get the first piece of real estate done? Got it. Um, I forget. I, I was specifically referring to the first piece of real estate. Then I okay. was specifically referring to how to do it with a realtor. And then I'm now that you brought it up, yeah, let's talk about yeah, yeah. the private company too because I'm, I'm guessing if I don't, I'm going to get a whole bunch of emails saying, Jay, why don't you ask – why didn't you ask him about the private company? So uh, let's avoid that. It's okay, so – so I, I, I'll do them. And, and what, what I did was, was like three steps. I mean, you can't – generally what I find is if someone – if, if you don't own any real estate and you don't own any other companies and your neighbor comes and says, hey, I want to open up a bar and you give them 50 grand to open up that bar, chances are you're going to lose that 50,000, right? Um, you're jumping way ahead. So what I did is three steps. I started with a monopoly game, right? I bought little greenhouses. And then I traded them in for big red hotels. <clears throat> and then I did Kiyosaki's cash flow game where you kind of keep or trade in the red hotels and then you go to small private company deals, right? So one, two, three, just like that. So I'll start it out with one. How do you get the little green house? And <clears throat> here's how you do it. You, you, you take your vertical job, your job where you're – only growing a certain amount every year, and you make sure that you live below your means and you save money. Um, and then you take that money, and it doesn't have to be much. It could be ten grand uh, or, or so, and and you buy. It could be five grand. It could be nothing, right? But you but you save some money, and let's say most people are going to need some money. I know you've done it with credit cards and things like that, but let's just say. Realistically, if you want to do it uh, the traditional way, you put 20% down on a house, you buy it, and then you rent it out. And that, that's simply what I did. I saved money. I took the down payment, 20%, put it on a house, rented it out, bought another one. And then I did that uh, over 50 times until I, um, until I got enough money to buy – into a shopping center. And, and, and a lot of times with the bigger deals, you need partners. Uh, it's just part of the deal. You know, they, they, it's, they're so expensive that it's better if you have a couple of partners. They're certainly easier. So uh, like the shopping center, I have two partners. Um, <clears throat> some of my apartment buildings, I have as little as four partners and as much as 15 partners. Um, and and that's easier to do that that way and and so I've done that. Um, uh, we work with a company called Dapt Acquisitions that I'm involved in, uh, D A P T Acquisitions, and uh, you can Google that and um, and 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 we syndicate apartment deals and find apartment deals. Um, and and so, anyways, to make a long story short, um, with partners, it's easier to get involved in that, and then. 
<clears throat> once you have enough money coming in there, then you could get into the riskier things. And they, these are riskier if you kind of like uh, if you're going to play craps uh, or gamble on a craps table. These are your, like your your hard eights, you know, or your hard sixes. These are your 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 plays that are going to be more about um, equity increase or speculative uh, equity increase than they are about cash flow. Up until this point, all I buy, all I bought was for cash flow, right? This house right. is going to cash flow me 200 bucks a month. This apartment building is going to cash flow me 8,000 a month or whatever it is, right? So um, the private companies, it's harder to guarantee a cash flow because when you're investing there, a lot of times there is no cash flow. There's very little. Right. So, um, so, so, and that's how I did it. So then I just started putting money into, you know, chunks of money into companies to help either people start them, to help them go through a growth mode, um, or to start them myself. Got it. Got it. So l- let me ask you this. Uh, now that you've had all of these experiences in various different vertical markets, et cetera. Is there anything that you would tell your younger self to do differently, but, and still give yourself the same shot at arriving where you are today? Mm. Well, I think there's certainly, you know, as I look back and so I'm looking back 27 years, right. Um, as I graduated college 27 years ago. So, um, I would say that I um if if I look at the points where I made the most money they were in the ascending markets uh the ascending real estate market for instance so if you could find and what I did is I I you know I was in real estate for a while before the tsunami hit with um with real estate prices and real estate transactions, which meant real estate commissions, more real estate commissions to me. So I was kind of building a surfboard, a, a, an incredible surfboard uh, for 10 years or more before the wave came where I was able to ride that wave really well. And that, and that's a probably a five year period where I got really lucky and made a lot of money. Um, and so what I tell my younger self is, uh, you know, be looking for where those waves are going to be if I had to start all over again. Um, it took a long time for me to get to that wave, at, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, and I think there's other waves out there that people can ride. I mean, if you have a – if you're completely free, you know, there's there's certainly – you know, all kinds of different uh, technological waves that you can ride. There's a, a marijuana wave that you can ride currently now. There's there's waves that are coming out um, where I think there's going to be a just an absolute ton of growth. Um, and, and I would say look for those waves and, and, and try to swim your surfboard out to them. Does, it, does that make sense? Is that a, a good yeah, lesson? Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. And that you, you know, as Wayne Gretzky would say, you know, on a skate to where the puck is going and right. that you're, you're saying the same thing, which then get, begs the question, you, you did not say the conspicuous thing that was absent if, uh, from your waves was any other real estate. So are you saying the wave is gone? Are we in a, what, what, what would you say? All right. Now I'm going to get you to his answer in just a second. You'll find out what he thinks about real estate. Most importantly, should you buy more of it? What I want to do is I want to make sure that everybody knows that we are still giving away a cash flow game every week to individuals who leave a review. That's all you got to do. Go over to iTunes, leave a written review, written review, so that we, <laughs> that way I know your name. Listen on the following Mondays, and you can find out who, if you won. Today's winner is Brian Auger. Brian Auger, send an email over to info at cashflowdiary.com, so that way we can get you your cash flow board game. If you want to win, all you got to do is enter. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you back to Pat, so you can find out what to do with your real estate. Yeah, you know that's kind of a good question. Um I think there's certainly um you know the real estate market today is uh very um 
friendly and and ascending in certain markets. I mean, there's markets out there, you know, parts of California, San Francisco, San Diego, parts of Texas, Austin, Texas, um, that are just going buck wild when it comes to appreciation, you know, and they got this crazy seller's market beyond anything anybody saw in 2002 to 2006, you know? Um, so, um, there's certainly ascension there. Is that too late? I don't know. A lot of people say that, 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 that's the beginning of a bubble in those areas. Some people say, no, it's gonna, you know, we're going to continue to crush it. Um, there's, uh, you know, I, I, uh, had a, a fortunate opportunity to, uh, have dinner with Robert Kiyosaki last month. And, you know, he was saying how he's getting out of, uh, a lot of real estate or not necessarily getting out. He's not buying real estate like he was. And, um, he's conserving his money. And then, uh, when oil hits like $40 a barrel, or whatever, he's going to back his truck up to it. So, um, <clears throat> you know, there's people out there, brilliant minds like Robert Kiyosaki, that are saying, stop buying real estate, um, or only buy it if it's like a massively, um, confident cash flow deal. Um, you know, I'm buying, um, some things now re- with, with section eight, uh, rentals that, uh, you know, I'm pretty confident that the government is going to continue to pay, uh, right. uh, my rent for a long time with these. I don't think they're going to all of a sudden rip out right. uh, the, uh, the entire section eight program. So, um, I'm, I'm doing that more than I have been in the past, um, and I'm still buying, but I'm not buying probably like I was three years ago. So I hope, I hope that answers your question a little bit there. Oh, not only does it answer the question, it actually, it probably helps a few people understand why we've purchased the apartment complexes that we've purchased or the cell phone towers and shopping centers specifically that we've chosen to go after. You're, you're only validating a lot of the same things that we've talked about on either on previous episodes or inside of our membership program. So it, it makes perfect sense. And, um, um, it, it's funny how small the world of real estate is. I was actually just on stage with Mr. Kiyosaki last week uh, out in Cancun. So it was pretty cool uh, to catch up with him again and uh, to kind of rehash some of those things and listen to him speak. Um, since we're having this conversation, ha- the the concepts of you know inflation, et cetera, are these things that tend to – are these things that you – specifically you find yourself concerned about? And if so, what would you say you're doing at this moment to hedge or protect yourself in that particular area? Yeah. Um, I mean, another dynamite question. I mean, um, it's a simple answer. I think uh, conserve cash. Um, you know, you mentioned inflation. Um, I do. If you think about it, I do think that things in America are too expensive. Um, uh, use college tuition. I got two girls in college right now, so oh, wow. so I use that as a great example. I mean, I think that's ridiculously expensive if you think how much a college education costs. Right. Um, uh, you, you know, th- there's a lot of things out there like that that are are inflated, in my opinion, and so. Um, could we see a depreciation, a deflation, I'm sorry, a deflation uh, in things? And I think absolutely. I think that uh, there's a lot of things overpriced. Um, <clears throat> that being said, um, I'm not an economist and I, and I, and I'm, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, but uh, but I, I like the idea of having cash, uh, more cash than I had yesterday. If that answers your question, I'm 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 going to start conserving a little more cash uh, than I have in the past. I totally understood. And uh, the thing I, I really want to bring to everybody is that the the there are writings on the wall. It's mostly following our dip process, data to information to interpretation process to figure out what it is that you need to do. Uh, as you you're hearing our guest talk about the strategies that here where he's employing, you know what we're doing. So at the end of the day. We all have to figure out how we're going to (laughs) ride the wave (laughs) or whatever the tsunami or whatever it is that's coming. Uh, We we just don't want to sit around stagnant hoping to to figure it out. At the end of the day, cash flow 
wins, horizontal lines of income, whatever you want to call them, something has to move. And hopefully that's you, you know, in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> I like that. Something has to move. And it's you. And, and I like how you said cash flow because, you know, if you're not buying for equity, which generally I don't, I mean, appreciation or, you know, equity increase, which generally I don't. I have been lately just from a boredom standpoint, from it's funner, you know what I mean? <laughs> but But the majority of my holdings are cash flow holdings. And if you're buying straight cash flow and you're confident in said cash flow, then you don't have to worry as much about um, conserving money and, and having cash. Um, so if you just keep focusing on cash flow, and cash flow will never go out of style. You know, that buying a, a house for a hundred grand and, and getting eight or fourteen hundred or twelve hundred dollars a month um, in, in in rent is is never gonna go out of style. You know, uh, I agree with you on that one, sir, 100%. So the, I guess if you were getting started today, would you still do it the same way? Like I'm guessing there's a number of people who are listening right now who are considering maybe their first single family house, apartment building, or, you know, whatever. Is there anything that you would do differently about the way that you were starting if you were starting right now? Um. No, I, you know, I think I really I did it right because I I I see I don't mean to sound egotistical, but I I started right with a lot of real estate agents and a lot of people, whether they were in my graduating class or or they were in my um, uh, real estate office when I was a freshman real estate agent, and they did it wrong, right? So um, I would say I wouldn't change my path at all. Um, you know, if I did change one thing, I probably would leverage sooner, would have leveraged sooner, meaning built a team sooner. Um, but, uh, at the same time in certain markets, if you, if you leverage too much in the wrong market, that's how you go broke. So, so I, I really wouldn't change a lot of how I did it. To yeah. be honest, there's certainly deals that I look back on and said that one was a disaster. I should have never invested in that. I, have, <laughs> you know, I wish I had never bought that or I wish I had never sold that. You know, there's certainly deals, but it's like I tell my wife, you you really will never know whether this was a smart decision until you're about 92 years old and you're sitting on the front porch of your mobile home and you're looking out there and you're like, you know what? I should have never done that deal or I should have never sold that deal because if you look at it as uh, – a year ago or even five years ago, you don't know what's coming tomorrow or in, in five years. And you may eventually look at something now that's a disaster and say, I'm glad that happened because it was because of that, that I did this, you know, or it's because of that, 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 that loss that I never bought something like that again, you know? Right. right. Well, yeah. And you're bringing up a great thing. And I think it's important for anyone considering getting their first investment or raising their first bit of capital or anything of that nature is, uh, I, th I find too many people, especially as their first one, they're, they're trying to get it perfect from the beginning. So I I'm guessing that there are, cause I know for myself, for my first transaction, would I, I, I'm glad that the first one got done, but uh, definitely knowing what I know today, would I have done it differently? Yes, I find that to be true for most people is that that first transaction or maybe even the first few, you're like, knowing what I know today, I would have I would have done them differently. Do, do you find that to be true for yourself? Yeah, 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 certainly. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I'm, I automatically go by, you know, back through everything in life and say, you know, how would I have done that differently? But, uh, but they're, they're always like little nitpicky things, you know, the big things I just say that was a lesson and was, it, you know, some of these lessons might be a hundred thousand dollar lesson. Uh, I don't know if that hundred thousand dollar lesson was valuable or not until I'm about to die because uh, that hundred thousand dollars, like I got a good friend, David Osborne, who, who lost a million bucks in like nine months on an uh, English Spanish language school, right? He, he put a million dollars into this gig where he was going to teach um, uh, people coming, uh, coming from Mexico to Texas uh, English. And, um, and, it, and it just went under and he framed the, the, a, a freaking the check or a check for a million dollars and like his, 
business permit for the business and uh, framed it in his house. And I'm like, you know, what? why did you do that? <laughs> and and you, you know what I mean? You're looking at a failure right in the face every day. And he's like, no, well, that failure has probably earned me $5 million is because I never did anything that uh, – never put that much money into something ever again that I had – you know, that little control and that uh, little knowledge about, you know what I mean? He didn't even speak Spanish himself. Right. You know? Right. And so that was a great lesson for him. And it, and it works for him, if that makes sense. Oh, it, it makes perfect sense. It's one of the things that I like to, to, to remind people is that you just paid full price for an experience, a lesson, a, a, a something that you've just learned, you mm-hmm. know, even if it doesn't go, especially when it doesn't go the way that you expected, you just paid full price for it. And I'm like, how dare you not turn around and offer that lesson to someone else at a significant discount? You know, even if all you did was write an ebook, how I lost a million dollars. And so it, it read this. So you don't, you know, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> right. If that's all you do, then great. You know, you could probably, you might actually be able to get your million dollars back by just offering that ebook, you know? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, those lessons are so valuable. So, which brings up something that I, I, I'm, I, I feel I'm very passionate about in that I think our school system does us a, dis, a disservice in teaching us how to fail. And I think it's a very necessary skill set for every entrepreneur to learn. And you've, traveled through many different industries. So you've had to have seen this or at least had to have developed some way of dealing with things not going the way that you intend. And I'm just curious, your your concepts or thought processes around, you know, failing and, and how an entrepreneur is to cope with those things. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So let me answer that from a practical standpoint, first of all, and, and, you know, and a lot of these answers are cliches, but a, a, a very cliche answer um, is exercise, right? I think that if you exercise, right. it's a lot easier to deal with failure and stress and, 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 and things that are on your mind. Um, and um, communicate, venting, you know, being a, being ha- having a group of uh, people around you that speak your language. I'm in a I'm in a group called GoBundance, and basically it's a men's only uh, fraternity for businessmen uh, that like to make money and and talk about it. And so what we do is a uh, you know um, if we have a failure, we can discuss it within the group, and other people get it. They're not like uh, who is this jerk talking about losing a hundred grand, right. um, you know. Um, so you need to have people that you can have authentic relationships with that you can communicate your your failure and that they could tell you, hey, don't worry about it. This happened to me. You know, I lost a million dollars on a business or I um, did that too on a house. And next time when you buy a house, make sure you, um, you know, do this uh, instead of that. Uh, that's how you buy houses. You know what I mean? So uh, it's twofold. It's, it's, and it's pretty vast, but uh, have, make sure you have a mastermind of people that you can vent to and also uh, just exercise and get outside and, and do things that are going to automatically decrease your stress level or help uh, pound that stress level into the ground. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Well, uh, having had opportunity to converse with you before, uh, I know that you you definitely take advantage of the outside of things. So, you, you know, because th- that's just we all have to figure out a way to, to manage those things. And that's kind of part of it. Uh, is there any successful entrepreneur that you've ever run into who's not experienced a failure event? No, no. I mean, a failure's a failure is part of, of the process. The only people that haven't, you know, it's like that old saying, it says you, you're, you'll automatically miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Right. So, the, the only way you're not going to fail is to not try. If you try, you're going to fail. It's just part of the process, right? You know? Well, I, I, I'm thinking people were probably very excited to listen to you until you said that right there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's just part of the deal, but you know, you can't get caught up on a, a, a word, you know? 
I agree. It's anything. It's like, hey, yeah. I, I mean, when when I got into real estate, of course, I failed right away. You know, people said, no, I don't want to buy your kid, you know, and, right. and, you know, I mean, just failed all day long. But eventually you succeed. Provided you don't quit. But yes. Yes. I, yes. I, I, Bingo. Right there. Provided you don't quit. And that, that's the thing that I, uh, I, I see a lot of people trying to avoid failure. They're trying to get it right the first time. And I just don't think that that's possible. And, and again, unfortunately, with our, the way the educational system is structured, it, it, it enhances the, it says you got to get it right. You got to get it right the first time. And you got to get it right the first time alone without helping, without any help, because, you know, that's called cheating. And that becomes a challenge to do. So if you had to pinpoint, you know, a number of pivotal moments that have allowed you to be able to experience the, you know, the success that you've seen. Is there any one, two or three things? Like if you had to say, this is, this is Pat Hyben's top three things to guarantee success, they would be. Well, I would, I'll, I'll give you six. These are the six that I line up in six steps to seven figures, my book. Excellent. So in six step to seven figures, I say, you know, step one is, uh, and, and without going into the chapters, are gonna, a lot of these are going to sound cliche but I'm going to, I'm going to roll through them real quick. The, the first step is set, set goals and turn them into affirmations. Um, you know, make them as if they're, they're happening now. I, I did this uh, since about 1990, and I still do it today. I listen to my affirmations on my on my telephone today um, <clears throat> that reviewed my goals for me. Um, step two is to track, which is to track your you know a- anything. Let's say you're losing weight and you want to lose weight. If you get on the scale every day, uh, you're going to lose weight a lot faster than if you never get on the scale. So you you track, track, track. Um, and then uh, step three is mentors and masterminds. You know, find th- you know people that you can learn from. Um, if you read Napoleon Hill's book Think and Grow Rich, he says um, he said if if he had to boil that he was asked in an interview once. He said you know, if you had to boil down that book into one thing as to why people don't succeed, one thing what would it be? And he said, I can't give you one, but I can give you two. He said, number one, which was your, your first uh, statement, which was, um, they give up too soon, right? They give up right. too soon. They don't keep failing until they succeed. And then he said, number two, they fail to, to realize and experience the mastermind concept which he was the one who actually created it, which was basically that two minds equal three. So if you get two minds together, it has the same power as three people thinking individually, you know what I mean? And so, um, so they fail in that mastermind concept. So that that's the re that's my step three, which is uh, get involved in a mastermind. Step four is to act. Uh, nothing great comes without sacrifice. You, you got to, uh, be in that fire mode, meaning you can't, a lot of people get stuck in that ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim. Some, <laughs> some days you just got to work and fire, 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 fire. You have to act in order to receive. Um, and then uh, step five is build. And, uh, a mentor of mine used to always tell me, Pat, he said, build on a success up, not from the ground up, meaning, um, find something that you succeeded at and then build from that in the, language of real estate, it would be if you sold a house in a neighborhood, stay in that neighborhood and go around saying, hey, I sold that house down the street. I'm a neighborhood expert. So you're building on a success up versus the ground up, whereas you're going to a different neighborhood where you've never sold anything before. Um, So that would be build. And then the last, which you're going to love is invest. And I talk about in the book how I went from, you know, um, a, a saver to a investor to, uh, you know, to the little greenhouses, to the big red hotels, to the uh, small company. So um, that would be the six steps. Got it. Excellent. Now, for those that have, you know, managed to listen this far and probably want to know more about what you're up to, what's going to be the best way for them to find out either about you or what you guys are over there doing at GoBundance? Okay, so with GoBundance, um, basically the easiest thing to do is just go to our website. It's easy. It's Go, and then it's uh, B U N 
D A N C E. It's G O B U N D A N C E. And there's a whole uh, calendar there of events that you can come to as a guest. Uh, we have a big one coming up uh, in July in in Denver, Colorado, where we're going to basically we're going to uh, climb a, a, a fourteen thousand foot mountain, uh, kind of hike it. We're going to um, see a concert at Red Rocks, uh, which is on a lot of people's bucket list items. Uh, we're going to uh, go to a Colorado Rockies game. We got a box suite there uh, that that fits a bunch of people, and um, and then we're going to mastermind and talk about money and and health and relationships and everything. Um, so you go to GoAbundance.com for that. And then uh, uh, for my book or any information on my podcasts and anything you need to know, you can either go to PatHyben.com or you can simply just Google me. Um, I'm on. I'm all over the place. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Uh, you just type in my name, Pat Hyben, and um, and you'll find me right away. Excellent. Now, uh, as we depart here, I, I have this one final question because you began to hint at it, and if anything, I, I've I'm pretty good at the exact opposite. I'm a fire, 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 aim fire ready kind of guy (laughs) but for those who might find themselves going i would like to get started and one day it would be nice if i could only or maybe they've made it so far as to at least they're listening to the podcast now and they're making some strides towards you know either getting that first property starting that first business or you know figuring out how to raise their first hundred thousand dollars so that they can actually you know get something off the ground but they're still kind of stuck what would you say to that person? You know, they're, you know, I don't know what the reason is, but it's probably that they don't have, well, let, let me, let me, let me answer that. That's going to reach more people. There's a new book coming out. Um, uh, you've heard of the Napoleon Hill book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, right? Yeah. Of course. Well, his his deceased wife uh, has given permission to put out a new book, and it's called "Don't Think and Grow Rich." Okay. And I'm just kidding, but but uh, but my point is that that's the problem: is they think, they think, they think, they think, and they never, <laughs> you know what I mean. So don't think and grow rich is. Uh, how you do it. And the same thing, it, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what do the numbers got to look like? And da, 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 da. And I'm like, I'm like, here's your homework assignment. Don't worry about it on your first house. Just don't think and grow rich. Just buy the house. Just <laughs> buy something. If it's close to the numbers, get that under your belt, learn it. And then on the second house, then nitpick the heck and make sure the numbers work, you know, emphatically. But so many people are afraid to just buy that first house. You know, I right. mean, if you're if you're buying it for a hundred grand and the rent is nine hundred or eight hundred a month, just do it. But in the next one, I want you to make sure it's twelve hundred or fifteen hundred. You know, for a hundred grand house. So, so just get past that first one, and once your mind has been expanded to owning that first one, and I'm sure you can agree with this because this is kind of how you did. Once you own that first one, it was so much. It was so easy to to buy the next one. It's kind of like they say. The first million's the easiest, right? I mean, the first million's the hardest, and that's true. The, you know, doing that, the building that first million dollars is the hardest, and then after that, everything becomes easier. And I think it's because your brain is expanded to um, to just firing without so much ready aim. Indeed, indeed, and uh, yeah, I, I can only agree uh, for with what you just said because uh, I can remember getting that first one took a while. The next ones, the next eleven were three weeks later. So I got one done, and then eleven more. <laughs> three <laughs> weeks later. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, exactly. like we here we go. So there you go. I totally understood. Well, I, I do want to say thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule for hopping off uh, the mountain or the hiking trail or whatever it is that you were doing, jumping out of helicopters today. Uh, I, I know you like that kind of stuff. So, but I definitely appreciate you taking time from that so that you can invest here with the Cashflow Diary audience. 
My pleasure, Jay. This was really fun. I really appreciate uh, you getting me on the show and having me here, and and I hope someday we'll be able to meet face-to-face and break some bread together. I have a feeling that that could happen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. So what does that mean today? It means, hey, for some of you, you know that you need a, a network of the people who think like you, be like you, walk and talk like you. So go abundance is the direction that you need to be headed. Others of you, you know, you're like, hey, six steps to seven figures. That sounds kind of cool. So go over to pathyben.com, make that happen and begin your journey. Take some action. You got 24 to 48 hours You on to move on the intent that you just felt like you know you needed to do it. You heard it in the back of your head. Now all you got to do is submit to it and make it happen. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>